This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Okay, I promised at the end of the last lecture that we'd now be looking next at resolutions, and those resolutions that require special notice. And here we are. So, resolutions requiring special notice. Remember, it's only ordinary resolutions. Special notice only ever applies to an ordinary resolution, a resolution that is passed by a majority of one more vote in favour than votes against. And it's not even all ordinary resolutions, it is just specific ones. How many? I told you last lecture, five. One relates to the directors and four relates to auditors. 28 days notice is given to the company. That's the bit that's special. It's a special notice period. Normally, notice is given to the members of 21 days of an annual general meeting. And all the general meetings and all the resolutions only require 14 days. But in this one, the notice period is special. The resolution is ordinary, but the notice is special. 28 days notice is given to the company at the company's registered office. The company shall forthwith give notice, forward that notice on to the affected director or to the auditors, whichever one it relates to. If it relates to the director, the director gets this copy of this notice that is proposing a resolution that's going to affect that director. If it affects the auditors, the auditors are going to get a copy of this request to include a resolution on the agenda. And the auditors are better take some action sharp if they want to have defend themselves. Having given the director or the auditors this notification instantly, immediately, the director and or auditor then has seven days in which to prepare their defence. Because the most common reason why we have uh, ordinary resolutions with special notice is to remove a director before the end, before the next annual general meeting. To remove him part way through or to remove the auditor before the end of their current year of office. Actually to remove them, to vote them out of office, it's a big thing, it's a big deal. And so these directors or auditors, as the case may be, have the opportunity to make written representations of reasonable length and not defamatory in nature. The word defamatory is down here, the bottom of the page there, not defamatory. To defame, the verb to defame is to, is to be nasty, basically. Is to say, I'm glad you proposed that I should be removed from office. I'm fed up with working with this group of monkeys that you call directors. They are useless and beyond belief in terms of their incompetence. And I no longer wish to be associated with this incompetence. Now, that would not be acceptable. That would be defamatory. And if you write your written representations of reasonable length, in such a way, then when it's received by the directors, by the company, the company can go to court and say, do we have to circulate these? We think these are defamatory. Do we have to circulate these among our members? Because we don't think it's fair. We don't think it's a, a non-defamatory way of expressing the auditor's thoughts or the director's thoughts. And the court may give them relief and say no. You don't need to send those out because they are defamatory in nature and therefore you're ex exonerated, excluded from the requirement of circulating these amongst the members. So the company gets 21 days notice normally and will normally, non-defamatory, send a copy of these written representations of reasonable length. Not only that, but the registrar gets a copy of this special notice. This special notice, this 28 days notice given to the company, and then special notice to the members, the registrar gets a copy of that special notice. So the registrar is now put on alert. Something's happening here, we're going to have a director proposed for removal, an auditor proposed for removal. So the registrar wants a copy of that special notice. And it's an ordinary resolution, even though it's special business. But it's not special resolution. Here are the five resolutions. I've been promising them to you for 10 minutes or so now. Here are the five resolutions that require this special notice. The first one 
is to remove a director before the expiration of his term of office. Directors, if they're not FTSE 350 companies, a director will typically be appointed for a three-year period. And then every year, a third of the directors will retire by rotation. A, B and C will retire there. D, E and F will retire there. G, H and I will retire there. And then A, B and C will retire there again. So it's a one-third rotation procedure. And if in the year of office, in its period of office, if there, for instance, we decide that Director B is cheating us, he's, we, we thought he was far more competent than he's turning out to be, if we decide to remove him, we can do so. And it's only an ordinary resolution, but it's by special notice. So we have to send notice to the company that says, we wish to have a resolution put on the agenda of an other general meeting the resolution is to be discussed and if is to discuss and if thought fit to remove Mr. B as a director of the company before the expiration of his term of office. And the company will then notify B and say, sorry about this, Brian, but you've been proposed to removal by special notice of an ordinary resolution. You want to write your written representations of reasonable length and not defamatory in nature, and let them have let us have them in the next few days and we'll circulate them together with the notice of this meeting. So remove a director is the first, and removing an auditor is the second, and the procedure is just the same. The notification is given to the company, the company contacts the auditor, sorry about this auditor, but we've had a request to include a resolution on the next general meeting of a, a proposed ordinary resolution. It requires special notice because it's a resolution to discuss and if thought fit to remove you as auditor halfway through your year of office. So those are the two easy ones to remember. Remove a director, remove an auditor. The other three, the remaining three, and the only five altogether, and the other three are all to do with auditors. To appoint as an auditor, someone other than retiring auditor. So, so KPMG retire at the end of that annual general meeting. And normally they would hold office until the end of the next annual general meeting. But they choose not to. They say, no, we've, we've been your auditors now for seven years. It's time you had a change. It's time we moved on and, and let another reputable firm come in and take over the audit. So we're going to thank you very much, but we're moving out. So this new firm, let's say this new firm is, oh, let's pick one at random, Deloitte's. Deloitte's. Uh, submitting themselves for, it's here, Deloitte is submitting themselves for appointment as auditors, but these are not the same as the retiring auditors. So the appointment of Deloitte is by ordinary resolution, fine, but with special notice. Big deal. Telling the members, hey, come on, we're changing the auditors here. This is something you need to know about. So appointing as an auditor, someone other than the retiring auditor, and to fill a casual vacancy, part way through the year, the firm of auditors becomes disqualified for whatever reason. And we'll call them Arthur Anderson because that was the that was a classic one. Arthur Anderson becomes disqualified part way through the year, but public companies need auditors, and therefore they have to appoint another. The directors have got two choices. They may choose to convene a general meeting. They may say to the members, look. Matters have arisen. We need to, to get your approval on something. Uh, our auditors have been dis become disqualified and we've been looking around and we've found Ernst Young and we've invited them to take over as auditors partway through the year. But we can't do this without your approval by ordinary resolution with special notice. So we're giving you notification of a general meeting to be held in not less than 21 days time where the purpose of the business, is, uh, the purpose of the meeting is to discuss and if thought fit, to approve Ernst Young as auditors in replacement of Arthur Anderson. And that requires 28 days notice to the company and 21 days notice to the members to appoint a casual vacancy in the mid-term. Now, I said that the directors have got two choices. They may choose to call this meeting of members to appoint a casual vacancy filling auditor. 
on the alternative or as an alternative the directors can themselves appoint a, an auditor in the midterm to fill a casual vacancy and if that's what happens if the directors appoint an auditor to fill a casual vacancy then that auditor must retire at the next annual general meeting and must submit themselves for re-election by ordinary resolution but with special notice. If it were just KPMG for another year, KPMG for another, KPMG for another, if that's what it was, then that would be ordinary business, just the reappointment of the auditors for yet another complete year. But if we're changing auditors, or if we have changed auditors because one has become disqualified and we've had to fill the casual vacancy, or the members, members have filled the casual vacancy, or the directors have filled the casual vacancy and now the members are going to approve that casual vacancy appointment. And those are the only five. Remove a director, remove an auditor, to appoint as auditor someone other than the retiring auditor, at an other general meeting, the members get together to fill a casual vacancy in the office of auditor, or the directors to fill that casual vacancy, then that auditor that fills the casual vacancy now submits themselves for re-election by ordinary resolution with special notice. Director auditor may make written representations of reasonable length and not defamatory in nature. Defamatory, I've already explained. Reasonable length, I've not told you though. Reasonable length is not more than 1,000 words. There is an expression in English that says a picture is worth a thousand words. Imagine a thousand words. If you're writing at 10 words per line, and there's about 30 lines on a piece of A4, that's three pages of A4 in your normal best examination style script. So three pages of A4, obviously it would be word processed, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be handwritten. But written representations of reasonable length and not defamatory in nature is what this auditor or director proposed to be removed, what's what they're entitled to write. So that's that. What are the five special notice for ordinary resolutions? What are they? Tell me. Remove a director, remove an auditor. Appoint as auditors someone other than the retiring auditor. Appoint auditors to fill a casual vacancy in the position of auditor. Or to confirm an appointment, an auditor appointed by the directors in the midterm to fill a casual vacancy. Written representations, reasonable length, not defamatory in nature. Resolutions. Normally the directors will determine the agenda for a meeting. That's normal. They'll instruct the secretary and say, can you prepare the notice of the meeting and can you include these as the resolutions that we wish to propose at that meeting? But sometimes the members may request that a resolution should be included on the notice convening the meeting. And to do that, in order to prevent silliness, in order to prevent frivolous, and do you know the word? In order to prevent frivolous actions, then members requesting that resolution should be included should hold a required proportion of the voting power. This would be at least 5% of total voting rights. Or not less than 5% in number. Or no fewer than 100 members holding on average not less than £100 worth of paid up share capital. On average. So the holders of 10,000, no fewer than 100 members, one of them may only, it might be that one member has got 9,901 and the other 99 friends that he's got hold one share each. That will be 100 members holding on average, not less than 100 pounds. The request should be hard copy, but it may be electronic. The request must be delivered not less than, now this is interesting, not less than six weeks before the meeting where they want this resolution to be heard. But special notice required is only 28 days, only four weeks. So if you're wanting to propose the removal of a director, yeah, 28 days notice to the company. No, that won't do. It's got to be six weeks because 
Under this particular section of the Companies Act, it is a six-week requirement for members to get together to request that a resolution be proposed. If it's the directors proposing the removal of another director, that's not a problem. That's just giving them a company notice. But this time it's members. Here we're looking at members asking for a resolution to be proposed. And in that situation, it's 5% of votes, 5% by number, or 100 members, 100 pounds. The requisitionists may request that a statement of reasonable length be circulated together with a notice of the meeting. And the requisition of reasonable length is not more. The requisitionists must also bear the expense of calling this meeting, but the company may decide otherwise, and the company may elect themselves. The, the company and the members in general meetings say, no, we shall compensate the requisitionists and we will pay them their expenses of convening this meeting, the expenses of circulation. Okay. Proxies. A proxy, that's an interesting word, a proxy, because a proxy is a, a document, or, but it's also a person. The person proxy is appointed by the document proxy. And any member, possibly because they're unable to attend, it's inconvenient for them to attend the meeting, maybe they're living in the Far East. And in that situation, that member may appoint anyone. Doesn't have to be an existing member, they can appoint anyone at all that they want to attend a general meeting on their behalf and to vote in the way that they have directed. And if they don't indicate which way they want to vote, then that person can vote any way that the proxy feels they want to vote. That actually may be contrary to the wishes of the, the member. But that's the fault of the member. They should have specified whether they wanted to vote for or against. A proxy then is a written statement, a point, written statement, that's the proxy form, the proxy document. Appointing a person, that's the proxy person to vote on behalf of an absent shareholder. Person appointed doesn't have to be a member, it can be anyone. And the word proxy is used to describe both. Proxies may speak at the meeting. This is unusual, this is new, this is not unusual, it's new. It's an innovation that's come about within the last 10 years that a proxy now is able to not only join in and ask for a poll, or ask for a vote count, but they can also speak at the meeting and join in the discussion, which is interesting because they're not a member of the meeting. They're not a member of the, of the company. They can vote on a poll and on a show of hands. I'll explain, I'll, I'll explain what those two are when we get to that particular page. I think it's the next page, maybe the page after. They may demand a poll, or they join in with others and demand a poll. Companies will provide two-way proxy forms so that an absent member can indicate which way they want to vote. So there's the resolution, there's for, against, and abstain. So the member, when sent this form with a notice of the meeting, will indicate whether he wants to vote for or against, or even whether they want to abstain. And the proxy, if it is indicated like that, the person proxy has to vote the way that this is indicated. But if the member doesn't indicate, then the person proxy can vote whichever way they want. Proxy forms should be delivered, proxy forms should be delivered, not the proxy person. The proxy forms should be delivered to the company no later than 48 hours before the meeting. If the articles ask for more, if the articles say proxies should be de deposited with the company no later than 72 hours before the meeting, so three days, that's an invalid requirement. And therefore, a proxy may validly exercise their proxy rights simply by turning up at the meeting because this extra requirement beyond 48 hours is not valid. Proxy appointed by a member, which is a company, is called a representative. It's not called a proxy. That's just an interesting point. Previously, representatives could talk and could speak at meetings where previously proxy persons couldn't. But it's a, a fine point. It's unlikely to be asked. And a person may be appointed, one individual person, human, may be appointed to be proxy by more than one member. So there may be five, six, fifteen different people. These proxy forms, open-ended, typically 
We'll start with the legend that says, I hereby appoint the chair to be my proxy, or failing him, and then they will write the name of the person they want to attend. They may even cross out the words chair, or he may say, I, I hereby appoint, and then the name, or failing them, the chair. So typically, a proxy will just sign a proxy form and send it in, indicating which way they want to vote. They don't, I believe, it will be unusual for them to specify an individual to turn up on their behalf. But that's the point about it. They can do, and that person does not have to be a member of the company. We move on to quorum. A quorum. A quorum, it will be defined in the articles. It, the, the company's articles, the constitution will say, and a quorum at the general meeting shall be no fewer than people present in person or by proxy. And it's the minimum number that have to be in attendance at the general meeting in order that the business of that meeting can be validly transacted. And if a company does not have a quorum, then, a quorum, then it is called in quorum. It's not, it doesn't have a quorum. So if it doesn't have a quorum at the start time of the meeting, the meeting is adjourned for a week, same time, same place next week. And if it still doesn't have a quorum, same time, same place next week, then however many the members there are present at that adjourned meeting, that will be a quorum, even though it's less than what the Constitution says. If there's same time, same place next week, and if we're still in quorum, it doesn't matter, we can go ahead and discuss the business. Minimum number is normally specified within the Constitution, within the Articles. Typically, a minimum number is two members present in person or by proxy. That's an interesting thing, isn't it? Because we're talking about meetings. And the word meeting implies two people. So can you have a meeting if only one person turns up? That's fascinating, isn't it? Can you have a meeting on your own? And the answer is, well, yes, you can. If we're talking public or private company, if there's only one member, then you can't have a meeting of two members, can you? If there's only one member, whether it be public or private, public or private companies need only have one member. So it's a strange idea. So an annual general meeting of a public company this one member will be summoned to attend the meeting by the director, who happens also to be himself. There will be a company secretary that can't be also the director, so the director will specify, she will specify to her husband, who is the company secretary, and she will say, husband, call a meeting of the members, and he will send out the agenda and the financial statements, he will circulate them to his wife, being the only director and the only member, and she will say, oh, by order of the board, you've certainly this notice of a meeting in 14 days' notice. Incidentally, you can have AGMs with shorter than 14 days' notice, so long as 100% agree. 100% unanimous consent, a private, a public company can have an annual general meeting like that. One member, 100% agree, let's have a meeting. And so she's brushing her hair or cleaning her teeth and she's having a meeting at the same time. You can do that. So that's one instance where an individual may be uh, sufficient quorum for a meeting. Another one is where there are two different classes of share and the second class only has one person holding that particular class of share. Then you have a class meeting with only one person present. Another one, where the court directs, there was a case called Rie Company, where there's a one shareholder holds 90%, and there's another shareholder who owns 5%, and another one who holds 5%. And these two are the directors. And this man was fed up with this. This is the company, you don't need to know it, but I'll tell you, it's called Rie Company, it's anonymous. And for the purposes of confidentiality, it's kept private. So this man wants to get rid of these two as directors. So he notifies them, special notice, so looking at a resolution, 28 days notice to the company, 21 days notice to the members. And he sends it out, and, and these directors don't put it on the agenda. They can be in the meeting, and he turns up, ready to vote, the meeting goes ahead, and they say, well, I think that concludes the business of the meeting, doesn't it? And he says, no, 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 I want to vote you. They say, sorry, it's not on the agenda. So we can't discuss it because it's, it's not on the agenda. 
So he goes to court and he says, will you, will you make them put this on the agenda? So they do, they call an, another general meeting. And there it is on the agenda to discuss and if thought fit to remove him, to discuss and if thought fit to remove him. Remember, only it's a 90% majority, got a, uh, sorry, and one more vote in favour and votes against. And of course, when we're, when we're voting on this one, it's 90 in favour of removal and five against. When we vote in this one, it's 90 in favour of removal and five against. Oh, it would be 10 against, actually, wouldn't it? So, there it is on the agenda. The second meeting, he turns up and these two don't. And they just didn't turn up at the meeting. So he couldn't have a meeting on his own because there was no director there to conduct the meeting. So he had to go back to court and he said to the court, will you direct that I can have a meeting on my own? The court said, yeah. So he said, on his leaving the court, he's heard muttering to himself. And if you could have heard him, he was saying, do I consent to short notice of, an, uh, of a general meeting? Yes, I think I do. Okay. Now, resolution number one is to discuss and if thought fit to remove this idiot as a director. Do I think it's right to remove him as a director? Yes, I think it is. All those in favour? Me. Those against? No one. And he, and he voted him up and then he voted him up. So yes, you can have a meeting on your own. It's very strange, isn't it? But yes, you can. The meeting is in court at the same time, same place next week. I've already told you. Which moves on to the last element, which is voting. Following discussion, to discuss and if thought fit, the chair will lead this, the chairperson will lead the meeting, and he'll go through the agenda item by item by item. And each time he'll say, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Next resolution is to discuss and if thought fit, to remove a director or to approve the financial statements. Or <coughs> Following discussion about the resolution, the chair will then ask for a I vote. Now typically the chair will ask for a show of hands. All those in favour and those shareholders present in person or by proxy will show their hand. Yep, I'm in favour. Those against, says the chair, some will raise their hand. And the chair will look around the meeting and then say, well, it looks like there's a clear majority voting in favour of the resolution. And somebody says, Chair, can we have a, a vote count rather than a show of hands? Can we have a poll there? Can we have a poll? And so the chair says, oh, all right. Then. And now a poll is a vote count. Because on a show of hands, all these individuals dotted around the room can raise one hand and say, yep, I'm voting in favour. But me holding 3,000 shares and 3,000 votes only has one hand. And you, sitting there with your 10 shares, you also have one hand. So your hand is as powerful as my hand. Now that's not fair, is it? I've got 3,000 votes and you've only got 10. So I'll ask the chair, said, chair, please, can we have a, a poll? Can we have a vote count rather than a show of hands? And the chair will probably say yes. And so missionaries, employees of the company are sent out into the audience in order to count the votes voting in favour and count the votes voting against. Polls may be demanded by members holding not less on not fewer than five members, members holding not less than 10% of voting rights, members holding not less than 10% of paid up capital, which may not have voting rights, might be preference shares with no votes. Or the chair himself may ask for or may say, let's have a poll. And the chair may may um, commence the proceedings to have, carry out a, a vote count. Votes are counted whether they've been by a show of hands or by vote, by poll. The votes are counted. Um, abstentions are not counted. If you don't vote, then you're not counted. If it's by proxy and the proxy is the person in the Far East has sent the proxy and said abstain on this one, then the abstention is not counted. The chair's decision about the result of the vote is final. And on the website, the company's website, and if you ever look up websites of companies and, and look at the uh, results of their annual general meetings, it has to be published on their web websites the number of votes cast in favour of individual resolutions and the number of votes cast against those individual resolutions and the number of abstentions. The detail is there on the websites. You really ought to have a look at a website just to see the notice of general meeting, to see what's involved, and to see having the general meeting completed, then to see the results 
of the resolutions that were proposed at those general meetings.